Right, well, John's told me to research and give a talk about a man called Robert Murray McShane. I believe it's pronounced McShane, McShane. And I didn't know anything about this man before I, I read uh, a decent portion of his life story and the account that Andrew Bonner uh, wrote about him. But there's a lot to uh, take in, so we'll begin with a quote of his. A man cannot be a faithful minister until he preaches Christ for Christ's sake, until he gives up striving to attract people to himself and seeks only to attract them to Christ. I think one of the most convicting things uh, upon reading about Robert Murray McShane is his the lifespan. You know, how much can you achieve in 29 years of life? Well, Robert Murray McShane's life, it shows us that a, a Christian who really loves the Lord can accomplish an awful lot. The Lord can really use you in such a short space of time. And his life story, if you ever do read it, it's a very convicting read. And w when we hear about the, the, the life of Robert Murray McShane, we ought to be inspired, really, to make the very most out of the time in which we've got left for the Lord. And McShane, he was a man much like David Brainard. Uh, he would, again, live a short but very fruitful life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 29 years, he preached, he wrote hymns, he wrote many letters of encouragement and a, a good number of books. He was an evangelist at heart, that's what his calling was in life. And his major concern throughout his life was the gospel. He never married, and he died at the age of 29 in 1843 in Dundee. So I'm going to give an overview of his life story now. So Robert Murray McShane, he was born at number 14 Dublin Street in Edinburgh, uh, up in Scotland in the May of 1813, so uh, around 200 years ago, or 210 years ago even. And he was the youngest child in a family of five, um, Robert Murray McShane, he was born into an affluent family, quite a wealthy family. His father was called Adam McShane, and he was an accomplished uh, solicitor. So his work was in legal matters, and Adam McShane, he was well known and respected in the area of Edinburgh. And he grew up in a large family home, uh, not far from the coast, and it has a big garden at the back, and he, at the top floor, you've got really, really wonderful views of the North Sea uh, from the front of the house. And the house still stands today. You can visit it. You can see it on Google. Uh, Robert Murray McShane, he would spend his, his childhood and his youth, his early days in, in the city of Edinburgh, growing up in his family home. And his parents, they really put a lot of effort and energy into his upbringing. Uh, they really did nurture McShane. And they put a great emphasis on his education. By the age of four years old, Robert Murray McShane could read the letters of the Greek alphabet. And he could also sing and read very well at the age of four. So he was very unique, very gifted. He began attending the local high school at the age of eight, uh, performing academically far beyond uh, what would normally be expected for children of his age. He was way ahead of where the vast majority of children are. And after finishing his time at high school, he began his studies at the University of Edinburgh. It's a quite a prestigious university. And he began that in the autumn of 1827, uh, meaning that he'd only be 14 years old. And McShane's uh, father, Adam, he writes of his son that he was of a lively turn, uh, by this meaning that he was uh, full of life, energetic, hyperactive even. And at university, this young man barely in his teens, he was a language student. That's what he uh, gravitated towards. And his main attention was focused on poetry and elocution, and elocution being the study of formal speech and speaking. And he was becoming, in his youth, a talented orator, a, a speaker. And he would, in later life, become a great public speaker. But McShane, in his younger days, in his teenage years, he, he, in his youth, uh, by any standards, he was a worldly man, uh, much like most of we are before we get saved. 
You know, he, he doesn't hide it in his writings. He liked dancing, cards, music. And although he spent time in church as a boy, he had still much to learn about the Lord. Now, the, the conversion of Robert Murray McShane and his ministry, it would really begin with his older brother, uh, David McShane. And his, his older brother, David, was nine years older than Robert Murray McShane. And Robert's um, salvation, his conversion, would really begin when he saw the death of his older brother. Now, David McShane, he, he was a godly Christian man and a great example for his younger brother. And his bro younger brother, he always looked up to David and his example and his way of life. And Robert Murray McShane, he would be very quickly sobered up and shocked by the sudden death of his brother David. And it was really at this moment he would begin to think about life after death and eternity in a serious way for the very first time. And Robert, when this happened, Robert Murray McShane, he was 18 years old. So death and eternity uh, became something very real to him, uh, very near to him, very quickly. And it, the, the death of his older brother always affected Robert Murray McShane. And a year following his brother's passing, McShane writes that, On this morning last year came the first overwhelming blow to my worldliness. How blessed to me thou, O God, only knowest who hast made it so. And every day he would mark the day of the death of his older brother as one to be remembered. Eleven years later, on the 8th of July, 1842, McShane would write concerning uh, his brother's death, that this day, eleven years ago, I lost my loved and loving brother and began seeking a brother who cannot die. So good things come out of bad, as we say. And, and the death of his beloved brother David drew McShane closer to God. And McShane, he began to seriously seek uh, after the deep things of life, eternal things. And in, in my opinion, this would be when Robert Murray McShane would go on to be saved, to be born again. And it wasn't long after this incident, he began to get involved in an evangelical ministry. And his studies at the university changed course, as now he wanted to learn the Bible and to study theology, to understand life. And back in the days of Robert Murray McShane, the Church of Scotland was still very much Protestant, and they, of course, had the authorised version Bible, the King James. And Robert, at this time in his life, he would begin to learn and grow as a young Christian to mature. And in addition to the Bible, McShane, he had uh, an insatiable appetite for reading Christian books, and he read um, many works by men such as David Brainard and Jonathan Edwards, the great American evangelist of the Great Awakenings. And McShane, one of the things he did throughout his life was he kept a diary, and it gives us personal insight into his day-to-day -day life as a Christian in the early 1800s, the 19th century. And I'm going to read a few excerpts from his diary. We read, June 22nd, bought Edwards' work, Truly, there was nothing in me that should have induced him to choose me, talking about God. I was but as the other brands upon whom the fire is already kindled, which shall burn forevermore. August 15th, a very short entry. Awfully important question. Am I redeeming the time? February 23rd, Sabbath. Rose early to seek God and found him whom my soul loveth. Who would not rise early to meet such company? And out of many authors and Christian men that have gone before, it was really Jonathan Edwards' writings on Christian resolutions that made the biggest impact on Robert Murray McShane. And inspired by Edwards' writings upon Christian resolutions, McShane went on to write his own resolutions in his diary, which you can read. He writes, Resolved never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it in the most profitable way I possibly can. Secondly, resolve that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I had come to die. Thirdly, resolve to live with all my might while I do live. It's interesting, even from such a young age, McShane, he, he knew that he, his time was short and he knew one day he would meet the Lord and he wanted to make the most out of every single day so he could have the best day possible at the judgment seat of Christ. And McShane, as a young minister, he would motivate his peers. People would burn from his zeal. 
To his fellow students, he writes in his letter, Do get on with your studies. Remember, you are now forming the character of your future ministry, if God spare you. If you acquire slovenly or sleepy habits of study now, you will never get the better of it. Do everything in earnest. Above all, keep much in the presence of God. Never see the face of man till you have seen his face, who is our life, our all. At McShane, he would finish his time at university in the March of 1835. And he writes, March 29th of the same year, College finished on Friday last, my last appearance there. Life is vanishing fast, make haste for eternity. And Andrew Bonner, a, a fellow minister and a great personal friend of Robert Murray McShane, he writes about McShane at this point in his life. His soul, writes Bonner, was prepared for the awful work of ministry by much prayer, by much study of the word of God, by inward trials, by experience of the depth of corruption in his own heart and by discoveries of the Saviour's fullness of grace. So between the years of 1835 and 1836, McShane, he would enter into full-time ministry uh, in 1835 and he writes that his life's work as a gospel preacher was an honour to which I cannot name an equal. McShane, he would work initially as an assistant to a man named uh, Mr John Bonner, Andrew Bonner's father, who was also a minister. And McShane, he would become the minister of St Peter's Church in Dundee in the November of 1836. And in those days, they established this church in Dundee, St Peter's, uh, as an, in an attempt to evangelise the people of Dundee, the locals. And about the city of Dundee, McShane writes that it was a city given to idolatry and hardness of heart. And he writes it was a very dead region. We hear a lot about this uh, concerning Scotland today, that it's very hard. England's certainly not easy ground. And back in those days, it, it was very hard ground for the gospel. And he writes, the surrounding mass of impenetrable heathenism cast its influence on those few who were living Christians, much like... Uh, Lot living in a bad environment, even the Christians there were getting influenced by uh, their surroundings in the city. And McShane, he writes about the Lord that, and I quote, he has set me down among the noisy mechanics and political wavers of this godless town. He was not fond of Dundee at all. And McShane, he would go on to preach in the open air, and he was desperate to see the town of Dundee change and for the souls to be saved. And there was nothing in his preaching that would tickle the ears. He, he preached really solid gospel messages. McShane writes about this, that if the gospel pleased carnal men, it would not be the gospel. And McShane's convictions about gospel preaching was the first work in preaching the gospel was to break up the fallow ground, to plough, to convict people of sin and to bring people to despair of their condition in their deadness in trespasses and sins. McShane writes that men must be brought down by the law work to see their guilt and misery or all our preaching is beating the air. A broken heart alone can receive a crucified Christ. When do you ever hear anybody uh, talking like that these days? You certainly don't get it in the majority of churches and just how far we've come since the days of Robert Murray McShane. McShane writes, again, the most I fear in all congregations, in all these churches, are sailing easily down the stream into an undone eternity, unconverted and unawakened. People are sleepwalking into hell. He was frightened for the people who would warm the pews of his church that would come down and, uh, and not respond to the gospel. He really knew about hell, the horror of it, and he had a great concern for souls. And he preached much like Baxter with urgency. About the purpose and meaning of life, Robert Murray McShane writes, God help me to speak to you plainly. The longest lifetime is short enough. It is all that is given you to be converted in. In a very little, it will all be over. And all that is here is changing. The very hills are crumbling down. The loveliest face is withering away. The finest garments rot and decay. Every day that passes is bringing you nearer to the judgment seat. Not one of you is standing still. You may sleep, but the tide is going on, bringing you nearer death, judgment and eternity. 
And I don't know about you, but reading something like that certainly convicts me and how much of my life and time I've wasted. And you don't often hear such sober preaching today. On his concern for the lost and for eternity, McShane writes, I think I can say I have never risen a morning without thinking how I could bring more souls to Christ. He writes, as I was walking in the fields, the thought came over me with almost overwhelming power that every one of my flock must soon be in heaven or hell. He cared for his people, his congregation. But Robert Murray McShane's ministry was more than just getting people saved but he was also deeply concerned about holiness, drawing close to God in purity. McShane writes concerning holiness, Above all things, cultivate your own spirit, he wrote to a fellow minister. Your own soul is your first and greatest care. Seek advance of personal holiness. On holiness, he writes, It is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. A word spoken by you when your conscience is clear and your heart full of God's spirit is worth 10,000 words spoken in unbelief and sin. McShane, he would preach hard on holy living. We read, it was McShane's custom uh, never to accept mere professions of faith as true signs of conversion. He writes, it is a holy making gospel. Without holy fruit, all evidences are vain. Dear friends, you have awakenings, enlightenings, experiences, a heart full of prayer, and many due signs. But if you want holy, if you want holiness, you will never see the Lord. Meaning, if you lack that, a real desire after complete holiness is the truest mark of being born again. Jesus is a holy Savior. He first covers the soul with his white raiment, and then makes the soul glorious within, restores the lost image of God and fills the soul with pure, heavenly holiness. Unregenerate men among you cannot bear this. He continues, get your texts from God, your thoughts, your words from God. And in addition to holiness, McShane was deeply concerned with prayer, and he'd spend many hours in prayer. On the topic of prayer, he writes, I ought to spend the best hours of the day in communion with God. It is my noblest and most fruitful employment. The morning hours from six to eight are the most uninterrupted, after tea is my best hour, and that should be solemnly dedicated to God if possible. So prayer was hugely important to Robert Murray McShane, and he wouldn't seek to do anything without knowing that he had peace from God about it. And amongst many things, McShane, he was a balanced minister. He spent plenty of time in prayer, in evangelism, But he also spent plenty of time studying and reading the books of the Puritans and the Reformers. He wrote books and sermons and his best friend Andrew Bonner would go on to write his life story. And McShane's life would take a turn. After several years of hard ministry in Dundee, of which he barely saw any results sadly, McShane began to suffer from health problems, he began to have heart uh, problems. And this, of course, distressed his friends. He was greatly uh, beloved by those around him. And McShane's doctors, they advised him to stop what he was doing and to get some rest. And McShane, he reluctantly listened and he went back to his parents' home in Edinburgh to rest a while. And this was one of the hardest, darkest parts of McShane's life. He, He felt alone, purposeless and separated from his people, his congregation. At this time, he writes... Ah, there is nothing like a calm look into the eternal world to teach us the emptiness of human praise, the sinfulness of self-seeking, the preciousness of Christ. At this time, he wrote to the people back at the church in Dundee. He writes, consider what fruit there is of believing in you. Have you really and fully uptaken Christ as the gospel lays him down, John 5, 12? Do you cleave to him as a sinner, 1 Timothy 1, 15? Do you feel the glory of his person, Revelation 1, 17? His finished work, Hebrew 9, 26. His offices, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Does he shine like the sun into your soul, Malachi 4, 2? Is your heart ravished with his beauty, Song of Solomon 5, 16? Again, what fruit is there in you crying after holiness? Is this the one thing that you do, Philippians 3, 13? Do you spend your life in cries? For deliverance from this body of sin and death. Romans 7.24 Ah, I fear there is little of this. 
I fear you do not know the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. I fear many of you are strangers to the visits of the Comforter. He was always challenging people to to live a, a better life for the Lord, to go further with the Lord, and to put away sin. Now, McShane, in this time, he would go through a, a prolonged period of illness, and this would stop him being able to quickly get back to his congregation. And in the spring of 1839, the church McShane was involved with uh, proposed that he should accompany uh, a party of ministers and evangelists who were to visit Israel, as it was back in the day, and to try and reach the Jews. The journey and the warm uh, Mediterranean climate, it was thought to be uh, medically beneficial to McShane. And he spent time in Israel and Jerusalem, and these were the days before planes and fast boats. It was a long journey. And he worked with his companions to understand what was happening in the land and to make Christ known to the Jews. And again, these were the days of before the internet, before TV, the world was a much larger place. And not much was known about the state and condition of the land of Israel by Christians during this time, although they did know that their Jews had a future. And during McShane's time abroad, uh, McShane, he, his thoughts were uh, primarily focused on the people back home at his church at St. Peter's in Dundee. And he would often write to this congregation. After surveying the barren spot in Galilee where Capernaum once stood, he wrote to his home church, and I quote, If you tread the glorious gospel of the grace of God under your feet, your souls will perish and I fear Dundee will one day be a howling wilderness like Capernaum, and perhaps it is today. Ah, would my flock from thee might learn how days of grace will flee, how, how all and offered Christ who spurn shall mourn at last like thee. He warned them not to reject the gospel time and time again. And sadly, 200 years later, I think the UK and most of the Western world is a wilderness, spiritually speaking, as evidenced by people travelling as far as California to visit us. And men like McShane, they would turn in their graves uh, if they could see the condition of this world spiritually, even the churches. And not long after uh, the travelling group of ministers McShane was attached to had began their homeward journey through uh, Turkey, or Asia Minor as it used to be called, McShane once again became very ill. And toward the end of July 1839, as he lay down close to death near the city of Smyrna, he really thought he was going to die. He had a great fever. And he writes, My most earnest prayer was for my dear flock. He really had a heart of compassion for his people back home. The cry of his servant in Asia was not forgotten, writes Andrew Bonar. The eye of the Lord turned towards his people. Their pastor, he, it seemed, was close to death. He was utterly helpless at the time. But the Lord, it would appear, had perhaps done this on purpose, for he meant to show that he needed not the help of any, writes Bonar. Now, whilst McShane lay in terrible sickness, back home in Dundee, things were stirring. A revival, the likes of which had never been seen before, broke out suddenly, centering upon the church which McShane was the minister of. And this result was really what Robert Murray McShane, he wanted to see all the days of his life. But now he was far from home. And people were getting saved under the ministry of uh, McShane's uh, stand-in, uh, William Chalmers Burns, at McShane's home church at St. Peter's. And William Chalmers Burns, W.C. Burns, he was a young man. He was only 24 years old. He was covering for McShane in his absence. And it was under Burns' preaching on the 23rd of July that the great revival at Kilsyth would take place. And we read, All Scotland heard the glad news that the sky was no longer brass. The Spirit in mighty power began to work from that day forward in many places of the land. People uh, began to repent and to get saved in great numbers all across Scotland, but mainly in the city of Dundee. And as soon as Burns began to preach at, in, at the start of August of the same year, many would go on to believe the gospel. We read, tears were streaming from the eyes of many. Some fell on the ground groaning and weeping and crying for mercy. Even with this chap who's been saved at the garden centre, you know, he, he's had a total change. There's tears, there's sorrow. 
and it's the sign of, of, of God doing his work and saving these people. And services would be taking place every night for many weeks. People had a real thirst, a hunger, a strong appetite for the word of God. And they'd often last until late at night. The whole town of Dundee changed. Churches filled up. And McShane, he would first hear of this revival, because again, there's no email, no social media, none of that in those days. He would hear of this later. And the first time he would hear about this was when he was travelling home, going through Hamburg, Germany. And he wrote a letter to Burns, rejoicing. He wasn't bitter or jealous, he rejoiced. He said, and I quote, You remember it was the prayer of my heart when we parted, that you might be a thousandfold more blessed to the people than ever my ministry had been. And he meant that. How it will gladden my heart if you can really tell me it has been so. He was full of joy at this news. And Robert Murray McShane, he would later make it home. He wasn't to die in Smyrna, and he managed to return to St Peter's Church in the November of the same year, uh, where he viewed an unforgettable scene. The people at his church were totally changed. They had an appetite now to listen to the Bible for many hours. They were concerned about their eternal destiny. There were many tears. And one man who recently got saved said to Robert Murray McShane, I think hell would be some relief from an angry God. People understood the truth about salvation, about the love of God and about his wrath. And even when McShane would preach in the open air, even when it began to rain, the huge crowds would remain until the end. And Robert Murray McShane, even as a young man, he knew that his time was coming to an end. He writes in his diary, I do not expect to live long. Changes are coming. Every eye before me shall soon be dim in death. Another pastor shall feed this flock. Another singer lead the psalm. Another flock shall fill this fold. There is no re believing, no repenting, no conversion in the grave. No minister will speak to you there. This is the time of conversion. O oh, my friends, you have no ordinances in hell. There will be no preaching in hell. O oh, that would use this little time. Every moment of it is worth a world. In McShane's last year at St Peter's Church in Dundee, he preached on hell. He gave four sermons on this subject, the fate of unsaved sinners going out into a lost eternity. But he was balanced. He spoke of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he always warned his people about their fate should they reject the gospel. He didn't compromise. He wasn't a man pleaser. And about his final days of preaching the gospel, McShane writes, Brethren, our people will not thank us in eternity for speaking smooth things and crying peace, peace, when there is no peace. No, they may praise us now, but they will curse our flattery in eternity. He always knew what was at stake. And his last communion service was in the January of 1843. And McShane, he preached a message called Paul, a pattern in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. In February of the same year, McShaney went up to the northwest of Scotland and he preached uh, 27 times in 24 different places, often travelling through heavy snow on foot. And on his return to Dundee, he confessed that he felt very tired. The 12th of March proved to be his last Sunday in the pulpit of St Peter's, and his final sermon was on Romans 9, 22 and 23. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? The following Tuesday, McShane felt ill, but he took a wedding service, and afterwards he spoke to a group of little children on the topic of the Lord, the Good Shepherd. And this would be McShane's last public appearance. That evening he went into a very bad fever again. And after lying helplessly for a week with a burning fever, a, a delirium overtook him on Tuesday the 21st. And his fevered speech it now showed the thoughts which were in his mind. As if he was speaking to his very own congregation, he cried, You must be awakened in time, or you will be awakened in everlasting torment to your eternal confusion. Then he prayed, This parish, Lord, this people, this whole place. Robert Murray McShane, he would go on to die on the Saturday, the 25th of March, 1843. He was 29 years old. Live for eternity, a few days more, and our journey is done.
And Andrew Bonnar's diary for the 25th of March reads, This afternoon, about five o'clock, a message has just come to tell me of Robert Murray McShane's death. Never, never in all my life have I felt anything like this. It is a blow to myself, to his people, to the Church of Christ in Scotland. Life has lost half its joys, were it not for the hope of saving souls. There was no friend whom I loved like him. And Andrew Bonnar, he went straight to St Peter's Church and he prayed and spoke to the congregation in tears, many uh, sobbing loudly with grief. And William Lamb, one of the elders of the church, often found his eyes resting upon the empty pulpit, thinking, it's empty again tonight. Over in Dundee, over 6,000 people turned out for uh, Robert Murray McShane's funeral. And immediately after McShane's death, Andrew Bonner writes the memoir and remains of Robert Murray McShane. So to conclude, McShane, he, he was a, a chosen vessel. The Lord used him to, to plough to plow this fallow land of Dundee to make it ready for the gospel. And after many years of not seeing results, the Lord blesses the, 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 the city with revival, blesses Scotland with revival when he's not there. And oftentimes as a Christian, we've got to learn a very tough lesson. Sometimes the Lord, he uses somebody else. He doesn't need each and every one of us. Uh, the Lord can act as, as he chooses. And it's a very humbling lesson. And his life is also incredibly convicting about what we can achieve for the Lord in such a short space of time. So he's, he's a very inspirational uh, man to read about. And he certainly loved the Lord and saw results. Amen.